Hello and welcome to News Click. I'm Paranjoy Guha Thakurta, and with me here in the studio, I have Palagumi Sainath. Sainath is a Max Essay Award winner. He's a senior journalist who's been writing and reporting on rural India. He's the former agrarian affairs or rural affairs editor of the Hindu, and he's currently the founder editor of PARI, which is an acronym for the People's Archive for Rural India. In the first part of this discussion, we discuss the agrarian crisis. And in this part, we're going to look at the media in this country. Sainath, you yourself mentioned that sometimes the media and the middle classes to whom the media caters to because they are the quote-unquote consumers for all those who advertise on their media channel, their vehicles, their newspapers and magazines and their websites, they can be sensitized or they can actually be concerned about the underprivileged, the dispossessed, the, the one-third of India which is struggling to live. When you look at, are, are you a little hopeful about the way the media has evolved or changed? Or do you see a very substantial section of the media still subservient to those in positions of power and authority? I think, I think you've got to make a very serious major distinction here in order to understand what's happening. For me, there is a very big distinction between media and journalism. Because what the media are not any longer about journalism. Yeah? Media, the med when we talk about the media, we talk about the structures of media. We talk about the institutions and institutionalities. You're talking about the owners, the business interests. This is what you mean when you say media. On the other hand, you have journalism and journalists struggling to do something which they believe is journalism within these structures. Yeah. And in a situation where, as you've seen recently with the Anand Bazar Patrika, ABP News, ABP News, three perfectly fine journalists are forced to resign because they did a story that offended the Prime Minister's office. Okay? And because they did a story that showed that a woman who had been saying her income had doubled. Tutored. Yeah, had been tutored and in her own words she said, I mean, she said that she was told what to say. So, by the way, newspapers everywhere have been laying off people in hundreds. Do you realize that the same ABP's Telegraph covered quite a bit of the, it covered some part of the Kerala floods with its correspondent being based in Bangalore. Indeed, the dateline says Bangalore on the flood, flood stories. So, you, because, they, because they've closed their bureaus. Because they've drastically cut news gathering, yeah. expenses on news gathering, yeah. and people who can go on the field, yes. at the ground level and report. Newspapers have closed dozens of bureaus. As you know, a year and a half, two years ago, HD closed six editions. Anand Bazaar laid off 700 people. The Times has been doing this for from the last 25 years. So journalists, some of the best journalists in this country are jobless because they refuse to be stenographers. As of today... Or public relations officers. Well... Or agents advertising uh, By the way, jo jobs in pub PR, jobs in public relations are growing three times faster than jobs in journalism across most of the world that we know. But the point is this, that you have... Uh, Journalism is now down to two schools. There's journalism and there's stenography. And 80-85% of what we get from the media, which it then directs at the middle classes, is stenography, increasingly corporate stenography. i stop you here. There's no doubt about the fact that the corporate control over the mass media in India has become stronger than ever before. Some of the richest men are also so the, the richest man in the country is the biggest owner of media. Mr. Mukesh Ambani. Yep. All right. We also see the convergence of what was earlier telecommunications and what is broadcasting. So you even have, say, Mr. Birla, who owns Idea, Mr. Ambani, Reliance Geo. These are, these have converged, you know, the means of communications because of technology. Across the world, 
after the Great Recession, expenditure on advertising has stagnated or hardly gone up or gone, come down in many countries. This has also coincided with the rise of the net, the spectacular rise of the internet and how everybody wants everything free. So the traditional models, business models, revenue models have turned upside down. So much of the media has become that much more dependent on advertisers. You mentioned ABP News, Patanjali yeah. uh, withdraws yeah. advertising, so comes right. back, you're right. or, or government, or the ruling political party. Is that one of the reasons oh, yes. why the media has become a so subservient? A.J. Liebling, the incredibly wonderful columnist of the New Yorker, writer in the New Yorker way back in the 40s, 50s and 60s, as early as in the 60s, predicted the doom and demise of the advertising revenue-based model. You know, So it's not as if it wasn't known that this would happen. Of course, it's going to happen. It's going to keep happening. However, it's also driven greater levels of concentration. Now, today, Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post. Okay, So you, the, the largest monopolies in the world are the digital monopolies. And they are going to increasingly embrace and absorb the print, television, and other monopolies. Online media. Online media. They're going to do that. Yes, I'm saying that the advertising revenue model is doomed. And, well, there's not much happening by way of manufacture or anything else for you to be advertising a lot. But that's, but please, Paranjoy, look at the specificity of India also. This is the reason why the media today, the Indian media today, are more craven, spineless, shameless than they have ever been because... They are so deeply embedded in governmental favors, whatever a government, whether Mr. Manmohan Singh's government or Mr. Modi's government, whatever privatizations of public resources that governments do, the biggest beneficiaries are the biggest media owners. So tomorrow, Spectrum is privatized. Who are the, who are the gainers? Ambani's, Mittal's. Tata's, Birla's, oil and natural gas are privatized. Mining is privatized. When you have got so much at stake as the media owner, are you going to allow uh, Punya Prasoon Vajpayee to say that this woman shows that the government has been lying? How are you going to allow that? You're not going to allow that. One minute, Sainath. Let me draw parallels to what happened in the 1970s. The emergency lasted 19 months. In January 1977, Indira Gandhi called for elections. By that time, she'd put not only uh, many of her political opponents behind bars, but some journalists included. Though, as you recall, after that, when Mr. Advani became the INB minister, the information and broadcasting minister, he was asked a question about editors. And he said, when they were asked to bend, they crawled. But why are today editors bending without being even asked to crawl, oh, sorry, why are they crawling without being asked to bend? And in what way is the, is the overall scenario when it comes to the media, when it comes to freedom of expression, similar and different to what happened over four decades ago? See, firstly, uh, they don't need to be asked to either crawl or bend. They're in fact bounding ahead on all fours like the attack dogs of the regime. That's what they're doing. They don't need to be told that, you know, this is an embarrassing story. No, they just immediately go and forge and manipulate videos themselves and show it and get caught doing they're it. They're more loyal than Doordarshan or All India Radio. Much, much more loyal than Doordarshan or All India Radio. And I'm trying to say again and again, the corporate ownership means that any different streams of competition in the media have, since the 70s, narrowed dramatically. You had exceptions in the 70s when the Indian Express would occasionally carry a blank space where the editor was states mainstream. There were many other smaller publications. Yeah, it was the smaller publications that did the fighting. It was the lesser journalists who did the fighting. And I think we should, in this meeting, acknowledge 
the wonderful Kuldeep Nair, <coughs> who spent so much time in prison himself, himself a dissident journalist in the time. But that competitiveness also, even the comp uh, comp capitalist competitiveness of media has gone in the kind of concentration, and I want to talk about the convergence in a minute. In the 80s and 90s, Paranjoy, you had a rat race in the media. In the concentration of today, the rat race in the media is over. The rats have won. Okay? So, you spoke about the convergence of media. I'm speaking about a non-technological convergence in India. In the last two and a half decades, large business houses have entered media in a very big way. They've entered politics in a very big way. Please look at the number of MPs who are Karodpatis sitting there who are industrialists. You're saying this is a key difference yes. between what now, happened 40 years ago? Yes, yes. Yeah. One, but three convergence. Three, three. Okay. So one is giant business houses have entered media in a big way, politics in a big way. The, the difference between politicians and business persons has blurred. Yeah. Second, giant political families, powerful political families have entered media in a big way and business in a big way. The Badals are a wonderful example. The Marans are another example and so on. You'll find one in every state. Third, big media families have entered big business and politics. So you have what, corporate, what Ben Begdikian, the great Ben Begdikian, described in Media Monopoly as corporate incest within corporate incest, right? So they are so closely intertwined, interwoven. Everybody has too much to lose by a changing around of that. That is going to ensure that a, they will resist until the very last moment when they have no choice, they will resist any criticism of Mr. Modi or Mr. Amit Shah. They might sometimes sneer loftily at a Satyapal Singh or a Mahesh Sharma, but they will not attack Mr. Modi or criticize him. Now, you've had a prime minister who says at a public, you know, at the inaugural of a Reliance uh, Group Health Healthcare Foundation or whatever it's called, that Lord Ganesha is proof of the fact that we knew plastic surgery tens of thousands of years ago. Where are the editorials? Where is the condemnation? Where is the thing? Where are those anchors so bold and brave and spitting fire saying, this is crazy. This is an absolutely loony remark for the prime minister of a country to be making. It does not serve this country well. Sainan, you painted a pretty bleak picture of the media. Uh, and, 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 and I separated and, media from journalism. Correct. Let, I will paint you a very bright picture of the journalist. All right, please do so. Because there is an impression that the space for independent journalism, independent reportage, where the journalist is not the stenographer, not the PRO, not the advertising agent, but is holding truth to power, taking a critical look at whoever is in positions of power and authority. His job is that of an adv adversary and antagonist. If that space has so narrow, has become, sh has shrinking so rapidly, what do you see? Uh, what is the future of, uh, for Indian uh, independent journalism in this country? I see a kind of guerrilla journalism happening. I find even today in the mainstream corporate media, I find hundreds of very fine young journalists who joined their driven by an idealism, wanting to do something, who then find, run into news editors and chief sub-editors who beat the idealism out of their heads with a stick. Okay, So it's a constant struggle. But here's the thing. If you do challenging journalism, you will be challenged. Okay, this is, There's no getting away from it. Second, it's astonishing to me how this profession, how this occupation, still draws the idealistic. I've been teaching journalism for th more than 30 years now. Year after year, I see those kids coming there and sitting, wanting to connect with society, wanting to leave behind something, wanting to build something good. And it does me good. It, it reinvigorates 
any any ideals that I have, it reinvigorates it looking at the young generation because unfortunately I think it's better not to look a lot at my own generation in, in the media. It's, it can be very demoralizing but the young give you that hope, they bring it there. And you're all, see the other thing is yes there is this thing space for independent journalism, the net people. I would, off, I would suggest don't romanticize the net, utilize it. As I said, the biggest digital, biggest monopolies in history yes, are, are digital, the, the digital monopolies. They have replaced the big oil companies, the far Walmarts, greater, and, and the and, and the steel they might companies one day own and the them. car companies. They might one day own them. They might own some of those monopolies, but the, but but also the thing is that the net, as many people have said many times, the internet guarantees you a voice. It doesn't guarantee you that anyone will listen. Okay, people have quarreled it off. There are rontier classes between us and so you can have 50,000 followers and likes on Facebook. You can't reach more than 2% of them unless you are paying Facebook for it, right? So I'm saying that that kind of mediation. Okay. On, on this issue of Facebook, today we have half the population of India below the age of 25 or 26. The median population of India is say 27. And in the run-up to the coming elections, we're going to see the use of the social media, Facebook, WhatsApp, the proliferation of fake news. So, I mean, it happened in 2014. There's every reason to believe that it'll be scaled up perhaps many times, uh, many times uh, that, that, that kind of operation sure. in, in, the, in the coming uh, six or eight sure. months. Sure. So, so what, what would, but, but how do you, how, how would you uh, sort of confront or how would you, engage with this kind of a situation? See, the thing is this that, by the way, I think it's important to, to record that social media are not socially owned. They're incredibly privately owned. Hmm. So it's in fact it's a, a misnomer. It's a misnomer. It's not social media at all. Social media makes it seem as if this is a platform for all of society. It isn't. It isn't. And like it, the internet was described as a universal commons, yeah. which is dominated by six corporations. The super information highway, the problem with which was all those super highway men out there mm -hmm. who, who now okay. own it. So that point is very clear. Mm. So the, the thing is this, that yes, it's going to get a lot worse. And I'm trying to say that that process has got to be since you and I and a lot of people who know or sense that things are going to get really bad, do not have the means, the resources, the wherewithal. You've got to do three things. It's not just enough to operate on the net. You've got to be operating through public action. You've got to be, that's why, you know, otherwise we could be addressing the idea of a special session of parliament on Twitter and not have to mobilize actual people. How many times have you been told you're not a journalist, you're an activist? Uh, you know, this is, well, I have been told that a few times, yes. But this is, by the way, the whole, the whole redefinition of journalist that has taken place under corporatization. Your greatest journalists in this his country's history were Gandhi, Ambedkar, Bhagat Singh, Many people don't know that Bhagat Singh was a journalist who worked in four different papers, wrote in three different languages, taught himself English. These were your journalists. Now, if these were the people who were my journalists, and I'm proud, how many journalists have produced collected volumes of 100 works like a Gandhi and an Ambedkar have? What were they? They were activists. What were they? They were Indians. They were human beings. They were citizens. They were journalists. They produced much more journalism in two, three, five years than you and I have done in a lifetime. Hmm. So I'm proud to be in that august company if you choose to place me there. However, I detest these labels and I, it's because the definition of who is a professional journalist and I am a professional journalist of 38 years experience, that has been left to the corporate world. So today, if you cover displacement, yeah, you cover the Salem Highway, cor the Salem Corridor, or you cover the Tutukudi firings, or you cover the displacement of people in Chhattisgarh, 
or the Polavaram Dam, you're branded an activist. If you sit 30 years in your newspaper office, polishing a stool with the seat of your trousers, day in, day out, churning out yard upon yard of corporate press releases as news, you're a professional. And you do that for three decades. You're a veteran professional. That is exactly the kind I do not want to be. Okay. And I don't need the certificate and legitimacy of anybody. You know, my readers know who I am. And your work will speak for itself. It speak for itself. Thank you very much, Sainath, for coming here, giving us your time. Wish, wish you and wish Pari, the People's Archive for Rural India, all the best. One thing, I mean, I, I just want to say again that the March of November 28th to 30th, which will take place, people will come from different parts of the country and assemble 50 to 100 kilometers around Delhi and then march those three days into Delhi. This is a march on a call given by the All India Kisan Sangarsh Samiti Coordination Committee. They made this call, 201 organizations made this call on July 14th. It's their march, it's their call, it belongs to the farmers and the laborers. I'm just concerned about how we in the middle classes can make ourselves relevant to this process in the midst of so much distress. Thank you so much yeah. once again for being with us. This is the conclusion of the second part of this interview with Sainath. In the first part, we discussed the agrarian crisis. In this part, we've discussed the media. Thank you very much for being with us and keep watching News Click.